with their finest hour. The baby boomer generation has been the single most powerful force influencing and changing the culture, politics and the economy. That's one small step for man. And this will continue even as they make the transition from their working to their retirement lives. Their exit will affect all of us. In May 2010, Stats Canada indicated that today there are nearly five working age people for every one senior citizen in BC. Well, that ratio is expected to drop to about two and a half workers to every one retired senior. The inevitable math is that ratio between the number of people over the age of 65, the number of people not in the workforce, however you characterize it, to the number of workers. The load's just going to continue to grow. And a good rule of thumb is that the load's going to double. Um, so then the question is, what do we do about that? Because what isn't inevitable is our response. What is inevitable is the condition. There are nearly 400,000 small businesses in British Columbia and they provide almost half of all jobs and are responsible for one-third of the provincial GDP. These small businesses contribute to local infrastructure and the cultural fabric of rural life and by rural we mean every single community within the province except for Victoria, Vancouver and the rest of the lower mainland. The exit of baby boomers into retirement will create business owner shortages. Today, 7 out of 10 small businesses in rural BC are owned by boomers, with many planning their retirement within the next five years. The next three decades will see a staggering number of small businesses go up for sale. With fewer working age Canadians and a shrinking pool of buyers, will rural communities survive if small businesses fail to sell? The loss of small businesses means a shrinking tax base, fewer jobs and falling land values. It means closing schools and hospitals, abandoning parks, recreational and cultural facilities and the disappearance of a way of life built over decades that enabled families to settle and grow in rural communities. I got a good life. I've had one of the best lives going. But I've had a lot of people that's been my employer too. Everybody walks through the door is my boss. So get used to it if you want to be a small shoe repairman or an entrepreneur. They're your boss. You got to treat them right before they come back the next time. But carrying out a succession plan that includes selling these businesses will not be easy. Given the day-to-day -day challenges of running a small business, 63% of owners lack a basic business strategy beyond the current year, let alone a viable exit plan. Obviously, if it's staying the same, it's going to be a ghost town. And that's really sad, it's so sad. You have to have jobs for them. Small jobs, I mean this job here would be a start, number one start, because I'm gonna leave one way or the other. Either I shut the door, or I have somebody I get to teach for another year. Simple as that, it's gonna happen one of these days. That's right, and I guess that's where a lot of these people thought. We are now seeing the first group of baby boomers starting to sell their businesses, but the old adage, build it and they will come, is no longer true. From a personal point of view, it took a huge amount of financial investment of my own. I, the, nearly everything I have here is the money that I've invested in the school. And I retired once, wasn't very good at it, and uh, decided that I would like to continue to work because I really enjoy what I do. But there becomes a time that um, you really know that it's not going to be possible. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be allowed to be around for the next hundred years. And uh, so as long as I can make enough or if you can get enough of a return to enjoy retirement when I do retire, that'll be fine. Only 10% of retiring business owners can identify a successor who is a family member. The rest will have to look beyond their families and many will not know where to begin. Finding a successor for a small business may take several years and careful planning. People don't have that money in their back pocket to make that 
type of investment or to sell your business or or whatever. So if 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 that's the case, and you've got to come up with something that's a little more imaginative for to get that partner involved with you, and if it's not cash, then it's got to be something else. It's got to be equity, a sweat equity. It's got to be a number of other things to make it to make it work. Morningstar Golf Course, uh, value wise and and asset wise, and and we're both building that asset base up together. So. Um, his, his equity position is something that's easy for him to work for. We learned the first year especially that we had to communicate more and more and talk about more and more about what we're doing because taking things for granted is an easy thing for me to do. When you've been doing it for 20 years, I just think everybody knows that's how way it's done. Well, that's just not the case. A transition plan may involve a period of mentorship, the passing on of skills and knowledge to new owners. It was a good fit, you know, he had somebody young who was excited about it and, and he offered, came to me with an offer and it looked good, so here we are today. All those things, the, the payroll, the taxes, all that sort of stuff, didn't consider it at all when I, when I got into this. And then I walked in and I went, geez, this is going to be interesting. This is all coming at me very fast. Yeah. It's going to be a little longer than anticipated which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's given me the opportunity to learn more things from someone who's already gone through and uh, made the mistakes that, he's, that he may have made in the past and, and allows me to learn from those experiences as well. While currently 82% of BC's rural business owners are Canadian born, in the future we simply will not be able to replace them from our own working age population, but we'll have to look more closely to immigration absolutely anticipatable that the, the first destination for an immigrant will be a city like Vancouver. But after they're here, and let's say they're here for six, five, six years, they kind of get to know the ropes and stuff like that, then what will motivate them and direct them will be economic opportunity. And so what would attract them to a small community, A, there's an economic opportunity there and that will be fundamental to them and B, that they will be some degree of welcoming and inclusion in there. And, and that means small communities, if they want immigrants, have to be proactive. Once they figure out that there is economic opportunity, they need to have a pathway to get there. And once that pathway is there, the immigrants will go. They're, they're, they're no different than, than the rest of us. So getting that, building those kinds of bridges, because once you've got a success story with some of the immigration process, you can build on that. And then it will become self-sustaining. But it doesn't happen without work. And it doesn't happen in both senses of the word. You've got to have the jobs, and you've got to make it work. Leadership must come from all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal. Everything from immigration policies and taxation to expanded business education and local issues of zoning and land use must be addressed. Agencies and organizations charged with developing the economy of rural communities will have a vital role to play. Developing innovative programs and the necessary tools to guide businesses as they navigate unprecedented change. Rural communities in BC will need to reach out to nearby urban centres for entrepreneurs. And as a transmission specialist, I had something to offer and I brought it over here. And once I did the three-day marketing course, it was get out there and make a business plan. I had no idea how to do that. Uh, no, I'm a mechanic, I'm a transmission specialist, and here I am trying to, to do a business plan. But once I started using resources and, and using a little bit of brain power, I got through it. I'm very proud of that business plan today. You don't need a million dollars to start a business in a smaller community. I'm way more relaxed, way more. And then that way, I can come in, I'm happy to come to work. I love my job, I love helping people. It's, it, it has a runoff, no stress, happy at work, it's a no-brainer. Taking a page from the marketers of the 2010 Winter Olympics, we will need to convince a new generation of business owners that you gotta be here and you gotta be in rural British Columbia where business opportunities await and where it is truly the best place on earth to live and work. This is a message that must be told and told successfully. The future of communities throughout BC may well depend upon it. Best case scenario is Somebody rings the bell. Somebody says, look guys, this is 
the five points that we have to deal with. And, and those five points will be pecked to death by a million critics. But you got to come up. Somebody's got to just stand up and say, these are the issues. So that will be us managing change and managing to change. The worst case scenario is that we sit around and change manages us and we take whatever's thrown at us for better or worse. That's, that's what makes this the point in time demographically where we have to wrestle with this bear because this is something that's going to happen and we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with it. Um, the challenge is, first of all, to acknowledge the challenge and then respect the people who are going to figure out how to do it and get them, get them working on it and, we, and, and get us all engaged in that process. The human and economic costs of failing to act are real. Now is the time to start facing the demographic shift in rural business in a way that creates business and employment opportunities for future generations. There is no business as usual in the future. 